let our listeners know and remind them that we have Dr. Franklin St. John with us this evening, uh, CEO of Herbisway. And if you're not following us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, then we'd like you to start in this very moment. So I want to go back to the, the company's burgeoning. And you won by, and how many of us have fallen into this trap? And I want to hear you discuss this a little bit with us. Companies burgeoning, and and you start to hire. And did you do you acknowledge that you got a little bit reckless with with the hiring, and you know maybe a little nicer office and the fi- no 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That was satirical denial for all those out there. <laughs> no, Tom, if I had to really say it, I, I, I think you, you hit it on, on the head. We probably did overhire. We over overpaid, too. And then all of a sudden, when things turned down, we've got this huge payroll. Mm. So we had no choice but to cut back. We, we lost some really good people, but we couldn't pay them. I mean, I have to believe that a ton of our listeners out there right now are saying, oh, my God, I'm in the exact same boat, or we were in the exact same boat. I know my partner and I did the same thing. We, you know, we were we were much larger as a corporation as far as staff goes, you know, 10 mm-hmm. years ago, let alone 20 years ago than we are today. And, you know, part of our thinning down was simply survival, and we managed to do that by making some very difficult choices, but in the process realized... We don't need all of those individuals. You know, we can do things a little leaner, a little better than we did, but we're just going to have to shift yeah. behaviors. That's exactly what's happening with with us. Exactly. Now, when you were in the hiring mode, did you hire one at a time, multiples? How did it, what did it ramp up? When we were doing our call center, it was as multiples. Okay. okay. When we were doing the executive people, of course, it was... One one off. Yeah. And if you could go back and do it again, <laughs> knowing now what you know did not know then. What Two would... things I would have done. All right. Number one, I would have got an outside call center. S- outsourced it to somebody yes. else. Yes. Okay. Number two, I would not have done the manufacturing. There's other people that can do it as well as us without having that huge overhead factor. There you go. Yeah. So if you are starting a business, if you're thinking about a business, then think about these aspects of it. Don't overgrow your capital. Oh, I love that. God, I love that phrase. Right. That is, I mean, you've just, Franklin, you have just cut to the quick on this. (laughs) You absolutely have. Mm. So, folks, again, we've got Dr. Franklin St. John with us this evening, CEO of Herbisway. Uh, We're going to be back with you in a couple moments. But before we say goodbye for this short break, I want to read a commercial from one of our sponsors, CentralCTDental.com. It's the home, I'm saying dot com. That's what I really meant. Doctors Camp, Sambor, and Lupini make CentralCTDental.com their home. If you have a serious issue or just a routine checkup, there is simply no place else to go. They're easy to get to. They're on the Plainville Farmington line. And if you call them at 860-747-5761, you can make an appointment or you can go online at centralctdental.com and do that one more time, make an appointment. We'll see you in a minute. Budwitz and Meyer Jack PC is a large Connecticut-based CPA firm with offices in Cheshire and Farmington, Connecticut. Large enough to handle engagements of enterprises with annual revenues in excess of $100 million, yet small enough to cater to smaller businesses and individual clients who expect personalized attention from partners and staff. Client service is the cornerstone of our practice. Our clients have a fixed fee for their audit and tax work. What this means to the client is we're approachable. Personal communication and client services make for strong relationships. Budwitz and Meyer Jack, certified public accountants. And the Emmy goes to Stats Magoo. This is Mr. Magoo's first Emmy for an internet podcast. Recently, he came in second place in the Moodus County Fair Chili Cookoff, and in 1973 was awarded the Sportsmanship Honorable Mention for fifth grade badminton. Wow, I, this is wow. I, what a what a shock! What a, I'm just so overwhelmed. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I've got so many people to thank. I mean, no, wait, wait! I have to thank people. That was Stats I, Magoo. I love you, Mom. Congratulations, Stats. Coming up next, Justin Bieber sings Smells Like Teen Spirit. We'll be right back. Sandit's Travel for business and leisure. We'll take you there. Sandit's Travel has been proudly serving Connecticut since 1960. That's over 50 years. And we're ready for another 50 years of superior service. Whether you prefer to come in 
call in or log on. We invite you to explore how efficient, diverse, and fun it is to book through Sandits Travel. Save your money and your time with us. Sandits Travel. We'll take you there. Click, load, listen on the horn. On the horn.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Open for Business. Again, our guest this evening is Dr. Franklin St. John, CEO of Herbisway. It's a company that sells and markets uh, Chinese medicine. Before we get back to Franklin, though, I want to read another commercial. And this one everybody looks forward to. I think especially Ken here. It is deep water seafood deep water. of Avon. And as Brian likes to say, it's just for the halibut. <laughs> they have Farmington Valley's freshest seafood. They will work with you and your schedule if you call ahead at 860-676-9657 or fax at the same area code, 677-2281. You can get your order in and they'll have it ready for you. Deepwater sets it aside for you so you can pick it up after work. Their hours are Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now, I'm sure you're wondering what's on the menu. I'm going to tell you. It's sea scallops. It's fresh oysters. It's fish and chips. It's soup. It's biscuits, chowders. And if you're having a party, it's paella for 12. And a salad is all you need. Isn't that right, Brian? It's made, it's made with spicy chicken, sausage, scallops, shrimps, and just for the halibut, halibut. So it's deep water. Deep water. Seafood of Avon just for the halibut. Sorry to put you through that, Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> we literally have viewers and listeners that wait for that moment in time. Not quite sure why. <laughs> but anyway. I think it's because of me. I, th I, I think it I is think. because, that yeah, was, I'm, I'm not going to argue. Just saying, it's that know. cheap. See, I don't have reverb. That's the, that's the thing here. <laughs> I want reverb on my mic. He'll never give it to me, though. Yeah. <laughs> so I asked you a question when we were off mic. Um, do you consider yourself to be... A serial entrepreneur and you didn't really answer it so we were putting you on the spot here I'm putting you on the spot well the first little business that I started was back in the 60s I had a little laboratory that I did testing and that didn't you know it didn't pay the pay the bills okay then I did contract research in uh, foundry uh, re research for for metals and that that did all right but it phased out. Then I had a, a, a wig business where I used to give wig parties and go down to New York and buy the wigs and come back up to Connecticut and, you know. That sounds like a sharp left-hand turn to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a little diverse for me. <laughs> like, maybe we don't want to know the backstory to that. <laughs> I got a lot of good ones, though. Okay. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> I had a really good friend. He was a coroner. These people weren't going to use their hair anymore, so I figured. As a matter of fact, they used to be human hair wigs what they were they were from Korea uh, the women would grow their hair long and cut it and get a few pennies and this was in 1968 and uh, then I uh, started a, a, a business uh, in the dental alloy field I started that in the early 70s and then went through to the late 80s and that was a very successful business. So what kept you coming back for more? I mean, you, oh. you kind of, it sounds like a little bit of a roller coaster, Bob, sled ride, all kind of mixed in to, together. Did you ever work for anybody oh, else? Oh, yes. Or, so you, oh, so there were... Sure, I worked for Pratt & Whitney. Did you really? Yeah. Lycoming. I worked uh, chief metallurgist in a steel mill for a while. Was this simultaneous to the business? Some of it were. Really? Some of it was. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the reason why I went into business is I just couldn't stand people telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing that the three of us can relate <laughs> to. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you make your own errors. And you've been married how long? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lovely wife. Okay. Seri uh, no. Seriously, Tom, she, okay. she puts up with me. Good for her. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> mm. You are, of, you are, without a doubt, though, one of my favorite type of guests because you are the epitome of an entrepreneur. Successes and failures of varying degrees all along the line, but very rarely a diminishment in the passion. No, I, I agree with you. I love doing what I do. Yeah. 
and I, I love working with the people, and uh, I probably will continue doing this until they plant me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> It's always better on this side. <laughs> we don't know that for sure, but we, we don't. But I'm, that's that's the only point of reference I have. So. so, where do you see? You know, you shared early on in the show that Irvis Way is coming back, and you seem very passionate and positive about the return. Uh, where do you see Urbis Way a year from now? You know, in, as far as business sales, as far as new product launches, what's in store? I don't believe that we'll launch any new new products. We have a number of products that are really, really good that we have not had the resources to market. So we're focusing in on a few of the products to market it. And I think that our sales will probably be up 40, 50 percent in the next year, mainly because of the private label. Wow. wow. We have uh, an order coming. We're negotiating and we've we agreed on the order coming from Dubai. We have another one from Israel. And I thought it was very funny that the people from Dubai recommended the people from Israel to, you know, it's That's strange. Interesting. Yeah, it is strange. And uh, we just had a, a, an inquiry for our hangover product from Serbia. <laughs> We're <laughs> hoping on this one. Let's, this product really works, but we can't. Serbia. Yeah. So anyway, that that's where I, I see us in, in a year. And I'd like to see the, the regular business, especially the web, growing the way it is, little bit by little, little bit. You it know. sounds like you've got a really good webmaster that understands search engine optimization. Yeah, we, we have a new, a new uh, person that's uh, doing our web marketing. I'm very impressed with her. I, I yeah, get I get that sense. I mean, yeah. there there seems to be a re a really strong connection there. In house or outsourced? Uh, she's in, in house. Okay, so yeah. you hired her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. N and I want to go back to an earlier point that you made. Uh, the phrase "Do not overgrow your capital." Uh, the sister statement to that, in my mind, is whenever possible, keep a cost variable instead of fixed. Don't hire payroll. Hire people who do jobs. And it varies up and down depending on your volume. Yeah, I think that we were, we're looking into more of like for our computers, for a company like I've heard them on the uh, radio. Uh, I won't say their their name here, but uh, somebody like that that can come in and do the job, and then they're they're gone. Mm -hmm. Instead of hiring somebody to do it, and they're sitting on their hands for 90% of the time and 10% of the time they're doing something really, really w worthwhile. Yeah. True confessions on my part, that was the, probably the toughest lesson that Paul Lombardo and I had to learn. And, and we have gone mostly contract labor. Yeah. And it's been a big part of our initial survival and to success uh, is d doing just that, is minimizing payroll and hiring out on an ad as needed basis. My my consulting guru hero in business is Peter Drucker. I think he's the god. And he wrote an article in 1982 called Sell the Mailroom. And the real gist of the article, very quickly, you've got a company and you build a mailroom in-house in the company. The person who's running that mailroom, the aspirations they have at best will be realized one or two management levels above where they are. However, if you outsource the mailroom, which is not part of your core business, to a company that does nothing except run mailrooms, you will get the best run mailroom in the world because they are judged by how well they run it. Ooh, I like that. I'm learning something. Yeah. Seriously, because we're thinking about taking the shipping back in-house. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it's the lesson that you learned that got you in the trouble in the first place, though, isn't it? Oh, yes, boy. I, I think of all That's the mistakes, point. all the mistakes that I've made over my lifetime, and I've made a bunch of them. One thing I've never been accused of is not being able to admit that I made a mistake. 
<laughs> oh, well, you know, sometimes I think that's a great quality because a lot of people in our society choose to point their fingers that he yeah. did it, she did yeah. it, they did it. It certainly wasn't my fault, but in reality, uh, you know, often it becomes, and especially if you're the boss, if you're leading the charge, who else is it, who else is responsible? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to explore something with you. You referenced earlier on multi-level marketing, mm -hmm. uh, and you know it, that this particular purchaser from Russia. Uh, though a New Jersey connection um, was involved in multi-level marketing. I think that's what yeah, they're doing. Yeah, any, I mean, we hear a lot about it, and truth be told, I'm involved in a company that, you know, is kind of somewhat similar to yours. It's uh, Young Living. I use, I'm a more of a user of their product than I am a distributor, though increasingly becoming more and more active in my distribution role. Um, but I'm curious as to your thoughts on multi-level marketing specifically as to how it impacts your business, but your knowledge of it as an industry as a whole. Now, I, I wrote a paper back in the 60s on multi-level marketing because one of the businesses that I was in was called Holiday Magic Cosmetics, which was multi-level marketing. But the way they did it was, it was sort of almost like a Ponzi scheme. And that's not the way to do it. Right. They were selling distributorships, and if you say, get another distributor under, you become a master distributor, and you're getting more overrides. But the product wasn't getting sold. If you do multi-level marketing, and you have the people doing the selling, you may have something really, really good. But you've got to keep your mind on that, that you've got to direct and make sure that the product gets sold. And that's what they're doing over, over there in Russia. They have uh, supposedly 10,000 distributors. And those are the salespeople on the street. That's correct. So is, does that become another marketing avenue for Herbisway, that you actively pursue other individuals in that realm, or are you mm -hmm. just going to hope that they're going to show up at your doorstep, take the ball, run with it, and you reap the rewards? Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're not going out after that because we have to focus on our individual sales is what we're what we're really doing. They only got nine people, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, I'm kind of raising the flag. And, so <laughs> and two of the people don't get paid. Um, That's me for one. All right. I was going to ask what group you were in, but you volunteered quickly. Mm. <laughs> no, we haven't. My wife and I haven't drawn a penny out of this business in f three or four years now. Really? Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah. But you're still at it, and you're still as passionate as can be. You got it. We, we love the product. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you have to. And again, I hope that, that our listeners are tuning in and, and taking you know a lesson, though. I think a lot of people that do tune into the show are more interested in running businesses that are going to effectively feather their nest. Would you agree with that? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's why people start businesses. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I well, think also it's the passion that you bring yeah, to the table yeah. that other people have. My my perspective on it is if you don't feather your nest with your business, then it's just an expensive hobby. Yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the biggest challenges? Ken, you're depressing me, really. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's not a knife, but it is a pen, Ken. <laughs> what are the biggest challenges facing you, Herbisway, you know? coming up is it the state is it the federal government is it in employees is it you know finding the right products to offer what? we have the right products there isn't any doubt on that uh, employees uh, the few that we have are exceptionally good uh, I think the marketing aspects of our business has to improve uh, and we have to stay focused uh, for instance, we're going after the New York market. Somebody came to me, one of the people today, and wanted to look into uh, going into sh Chicago. Well, we can't, we can't move in that area until we've, we've conquered the New York market. Yeah. Then we'll expand out. Get a model that works and then yeah. duplicate so, the model. So I'm curious, though, as to knowing your product, what are the determinations, geographic, demographic, and psychographic, that makes the decision as to New York makes more sense as a starting place as opposed to Chicago, as opposed to well, L.A.? What, 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 what goes into you guys making determine that you're going to drop your dollars in that marketplace as opposed to 50 others across the U.S.? 
I think I told you before that I had a live radio show in New York for uh -huh. probably four or five years. And then ESPN came in and bought the radio station, and that was the end of our show. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have... Uh, the, we're recognized in New York somewhat. Ah, okay. okay. So that's the reason why we want to go go back into that. that Plus, it's a so large, there's some market large market. Oh, it's absolutely. Yeah. And I have to believe, knowing a fair amount about the product line that you folks offer and similar products, that there's a whole lot of those crunchy granola types living and residing in greater New York. I would think there's also a large Chinese population. And are they a big part? No. Okay. Really? No, no. It's surprisingly so. It's the uh, middle-aged uh, women who okay. buy the, the product, and a lot of times they buy it for their husband. It's the boomer generation <laughs> afraid of getting older. Well, you know, it's like anything else. If you're 70, you want to see 71. If you're 80, you want to see 81. You know that someday it's going to end, but it's not now. Yeah. Sometime in the future. That's good, but I want to know what the heck he means by middle age. <laughs> middle age? Yeah. <It's> 70. <laughs> <laughs> we got a long way to go, Brian. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> You're just middle age. <laughs> um, uh, one the last question I have for you. When you talk about the number one challenge in answer to Tommy, you said that we need to improve our marketing. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, I think I need a marketing consultant to, <laughs> so we can improve our marketing. We know that we want to do direct response type uh, marketing. Okay. And we're, we've now you know, gone back to the radio. Uh, I want to do infomercials again. I think if we do this correctly, I think we can increase the direct response again. So that's basically where we want to, want to go and what we want to in, improve on is the direct response and the web, too, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, for everybody listening out there, if you are a consumer marketing expert, we have a prospect for you. <laughs> you know, I tell you something about experts, okay? They're experts until they get to you, and then all of a sudden they're experimenting also. Mm. It's a great observation. Well, <laughs> Tommy, you know as well as I do that marketing is an ongoing experiment. You're never quite sure what message to what market is going to work until you try it. You just got to know when to get in and out quick. That's the truth. There's more and more science to it uh, all the time. Uh, but at the same time, there's no question that there's a lot of experimentation that goes on. Franklin St. John, thank you very much for joining us this evening on Open for Business. It was great having you here and inspiration. Keep on keeping on, my friend. That was thank fun. You. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Folks, we'll see you next week. Brian, thank you. Ken, thank you. Uh, and we'll again, we'll see you next week. Open for Business. Cheers. Listen on the horn. On the horn.